Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, corn dog lovers of all ages, welcome to In the Box with your hosts, Matt and Adam. And Geo. Everybody get. Good evening, MASL in the box family. Sunflower State Night, Monday, November 8th, 2021. Matt has a sunflower jersey on. We got the three sunflower guys. Uh, Joey, Nick, Charles, welcome. Thank you for joining. How are you guys tonight? Uh, Good. We just really appreciate you for having us on again. Um, The last time we were on, we had a lot of fun and um you guys are always having a good time so we always like to jump in for at least an episode a season as long as you guys are willing to have us yeah definitely i mean we say all the time and then we're bad at scheduling so it's definitely on us and it's not anything against you when we uh we're we're bad at scheduling because we don't know what's going to happen until like five minutes before the show really happens remember that remember that like one span where we didn't have anything and then, like, within, like, 10 minutes, we're like, okay, we're good for two months. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, guys, we don't have any shows. What are we going to do? Should we just take a week off? Should we take a break? And then we all message a couple of people like, all right, we're booked for eight weeks solid. <laughs> that was when, that was back in COVID times when nobody had anything to do, though. That's true. That's true. But now we got stuff to do. Well, yeah, we got shows to do. Yeah. And people uh, d- d- driving home and, and from... Well, probably That's soccer. Right. That's right. Yeah, but at least I'm Nick. I'm almost home. I'm like a minute away. There you go. At least Nick isn't actually driving. You actually drive and do this. 
I think it has someone else driving for him. That's true. I've got my chauffeur. Oh, oh so he's big. So he's big time. Is that? Is that? Yeah, the, uh, chauffeur, cars? and you know, Joey has limos for all his guys, and. <laughs> yeah. Wow, Leo. Nice. So, uh, Charles, we know uh, Joey. We know Nick. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Yeah. Um, originally from Racine, Wisconsin, came down to Kansas City uh, to attend Rockhurst University, uh, where I got to play alongside Nick and Joey. And then I uh, actually had the pleasure of having Nick as a coach for my last couple of years at Rockhurst as well. Nice. I'm out in East Troy, so I'm uh, 20 minutes, 25 minutes to your hometown's west or so. Or so. Yeah, it's it crazy. I've met, uh, I've met a lot of people from Wisconsin through the game of soccer. Yeah. It's, it's a small world. Yeah. And a little fun fact, uh, Charles' dad used to play for the Wave, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Nice. Yep. Yeah, played for the Milwaukee Wave in the 80s. Nice. Well, that's cool. Welcome aboard. Glad you could join us. We're going to tour Charles Nick's house right now. now. Yeah. In the box, in the box cribs. In yeah. the box cribs what, edition. Yeah, there you go. What do you guys want to say? Uh, um, <laughs> probably not your ceiling, but you know, here we are. <laughs> so, uh, tell us uh, what uh, what are the plans for uh, Sunflower? When uh, when it, so for those of you who don't know, Sunflower is in the uh, MSL three. Nick McDonald is the uh, head coach. Joey's the owner. Charles is the Star, uh, what position are you playing, Charles? Um, I'm actually uh, one of the financial directors. Oh, yeah, okay. Oh, I thought you were playing. Okay. <laughs> they, they let me hop in to practice every now and then. There you go. There you go. Yeah. And also, he helps um, run our adult men's program alongside Brian Clark, uh, which helped start the program, which was a team that me and Nick played on also before some part of that class, which is called Peso Blanco, that still competes in – competitive league competition in the Kansas City area and every once in a while plays in a regional tournament. But um, get started with um, what we're doing with Sunflower this season. Um, right now we're going to play our home games of Soccer Nation for the MASL3. We'll be competing again the Heartland um, Division slash Conference. Um, we are looking to um, last year we came up short in the championship against the Omar Kings, unfortunately. And we're going to come back strong, trying to win, win a title and see where, see where we can go. Right now, we're trying to expand the brand, um, trying to see um, what we can do as a club to be able to expand it. Right now, our platform, we've uh, decided to take on a women's team and we're going to be in the UWS this to this summer. And we've also, Nick McDonald has done a great job with Chandler Giggler in starting a uh, youth academy um, out at the U5, U6 level, if I'm not mistaken, on that age group. Correct me if I'm wrong, Nick. And then, uh, yeah, U6, U7. And we're going to be, they've been doing outdoor and they're transitioning to indoor right now. And on top of that, our club affiliate, Youth Rise, um, has moved up to uh, Heartland Division One and their their girls team actually just won the uh, Heart Heartland Championship uh, a couple of weeks back, and they got to compete in a ECNL tournament this past weekend. Nice. So we got a lot of good things going on. Um, the future of the club right now. Uh, we got a couple of things in motion. We got a couple of things that we're trying to see how what we can do for a club expansion. But once we got those things settled, we want to stabilize as a club to be able to show um, who we are um, as a neighborhood team, that we want to be something that is for the community and for the city and not just for ourselves. And that's one of the things that we really, really want to show is that we're about the community. Nice, yeah, I know you always always have a good, uh, good following here in the chat. Shout out to all the Sunflower fans in the chat here. Um, hey, Nick, check your Facebook Messenger. I sent you a different link that might work a little bit better. Oh, uh, okay. But not that I want to just kick you off. <laughs> sounds like he's got an iPhone 8 Plus, too. I was going to say, it sounds like he has an iPhone, yeah. Um, <laughs> so we, we used to do this on Zoom, and Zoom is just kind of like an all-around terrible platform, and then we tried this on uh, 
this is a program called OBS and there's a web interface and all this other stuff. And Matt and I have been kind of struggling and practicing testing and different things. I've actually been working with a developer of this software to, to get on. So get a couple things to try and uh, we'll see if they work. Yeah. So how was, how was uh, the, did you guys have an outdoor season uh, this year? Uh, yes, we did. Uh, Nick can take it a little bit. Um, we were in the UPSL. Is, is that better? Am I, yeah, I think am it I is. Good? Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Uh, yeah. We, so we had an outdoor season. We, um, this was actually our first year in an actual, uh, league. Um, because the year before that COVID messed everything up and, um, we couldn't get, none of the leagues were having seasons. So we did. Okay. I think we got third place. We were, uh, about three minutes away from getting first, but kept giving up like 90, 90th minute goals, which was incredibly frustrating. But, what, was, um, what was the name? What was the name of that team with all the, the Comets players on it? Uh, Oh, Barraleros, yeah, yeah. Did you did They're you at least rivals. beat them? Yeah, so we we beat them. We beat them five zero, and then we tied them the next game. Uh, then, yeah, it counts as a win to me. I mean, that's a win. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so Ken, Kenny Mayer uh, put a bunch of sunflower stickers and um, decorated Sosa's locker because Sosa was the coach of Barraleros, so. I think they're still up, actually. I think he's just not taking them down. It's That's pretty, pretty awesome. As I'll, as I'll, see if get, I could, I, I'll see if I could get you guys a picture of it. Yeah. As soon as you guys join M1, he's ripping that whole thing off. You, you know that's going to happen. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I hear the rumors of a scrimmage game coming up. Um, what can you tell us about that? Uh, so we will be playing against uh, – St. Louis ambush on November 20th. The time is still to be determined. Um, it's just going to be a little uh, scrimmage. Um, we had a couple guys get signed lately with the St. Louis ambush, White Fowler and Tio Flava, which is a uh, Tio is a goalkeeper and White's a midfielder. We also had um, Cody Belger go out there. He's been playing um, on practice team a little bit. And then we had a couple other guys go out there as well, but they didn't get a contract, unfortunately. But we've had um, a good relationship going so far with the players, and um, they buy us out for a scrimmage, and we'll see how it goes. Is it going to be with fans and everything? Um, it's going to be open to the public. The arena is not going to be their usual game day arena, huh. but it might be arena. It might be the practice facility, practice app, but – um, fans will be uh, invited to come if they want. Nice. So as a fan of a team in the same division as uh, St. Louis, can we get a scouting report on Tito? <laughs> yeah, uh, Charles, Charles, give him the scouting report on Tito. Scouting report on Tito? <laughs> no, Tito, Tito's a good guy. I just talked to him on the phone the other night. He's a good guy. Um He's a good goalie, so I hope I hope he at least gets a chance, at least in the Central Cup and in some of these scrimmages. I know they're probably looking for another goalie, but uh, hopefully, hopefully, it's a game or two here and there. So I think yeah, he's yeah, enjoying himself. Yeah. I think he's, yeah, I know. I think I think he's learning from uh, a lot from Paulo, and he likes uh, he likes having that. And he was training with us with the comments before, so. Um, He's learning a lot. Yeah. And one thing to mention, Tito what came from the Youth Rise program, which is um, what our club affiliate. Oh, nice. And uh, Youth Rise is that um, inner city um, organization that helps kids play club soccer. Hey, Charles, for some reason you're not showing up in the main thing, and I don't think we can hear you. Can I say something? Yeah, can you guys hear me? Yeah, I can hear him. Oh, I can't hear him at I, all. I can, I can hear him. Yeah. Weird. Good. Something's wrong with Adam's uh, thing. Good. What's new? All right, well, 
Someone will have to translate from silence to being able to hear. <laughs> should, should I drop and try and <laughs> There's uh, the board. Rewind. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, for everyone else, Gio wasn't able to join us. He came down okay. with uh, some kind of a goalkeeper rule-itis or something and uh, wasn't able to join <laughs> tonight. So, uh, so I mean, the big news, obviously, we're going to talk about this when you guys are done, but um, I have gotten confirmation the new goalkeeper rule is going into effect for the M3 as well. Uh, what do you guys yeah. think about that? How much is that going to change your, your already probably into practices already? How much is that going to change things for you? Yeah. So, um, I, I always, I, I told the team, I told them, I was like, Hey, we're, we're going on uh in the box corn dog tonight. You guys got to join. So hopefully a lot of them are listening. Uh, one thing I like to do when I coach, I like to poke fun at the goalies and, um, and make fun of them a lot just for being goalies. Um, so uh, I, I told them I would make fun of them tonight. So here that is. Uh, I, I think they're trying to kind of eliminate the goalies from the game. And I would say to them, good. But uh, no, I'm just all, – all jokes aside, it's it's been – not as hard or not as difficult, I would say, because we didn't have all of the goalies that we have right now did not play with us last year. And so they're all brand new to indoor. So it's something that we can kind of, um, we don't have to like reteach them anything. Um, but I, I think the main thing would be getting the field players used to playing out of the back. And we've, we've worked on that a little bit. And I think it'll be interesting to see. Um, how it works out in an actual game because we haven't really tested it out. We haven't had a scrimmage or anything, so it'll be interesting to see. I know the league tested it out though, so yeah. And I'm gonna I'll, we'll talk more um, yeah. after this. I don't want to take up all your time for for talking about the thing that we're gonna just talk obsessively about after this. But uh, yeah. just figured you know we did we have an actual coach of an actual team around our show for for uh, once in, in a long time. So I figured I would ask what you yeah. thought about it. And uh, have you started practicing it as a team or? Yeah, so we have, we've, we've actually had a little bit of difficulties um, facility wise, but we've had a few, a, a couple weeks of practice and yeah. um, our, our season will start later, but we've got a lot of new guys. So it, the, the whole thing, first couple of weeks like the whole first few weeks last year was all just teaching them the game of indoor because they've all played pickup indoor and sunday league indoor but um as we all know this is a lot different than that so yeah it's slightly different slightly different um but i mean i i would assume most of the guys who have played have played some sort of indoor in their lives, whether, you know, it's probably not the exact, you know, like here's your, you know, you, you know it from by heart where the people are going to be and, you know, no look passes and things like that because you just know where the guys are, yeah. but it's, you know, it's still, still the boards that they've been playing on and things like that growing up. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. But I, I, th th there are a few times where, yeah, they, they still definitely need to get used to using the boards and the, defending aspect especially the defending aspects because you and i both know uh, when they're playing youth soccer and indoor it's completely different like defensively at least than um than this is so yeah. it's just teaching them all the all the movements all the how we want to defend a lot of them don't want to defend at all so <laughs> uh, that's a big thing but they're, they're, they're getting it. We, we had, um, we have practice tomorrow. So and that, that St. Louis game will be a big one for, um, all of our new guys at least. And then you're going to be playing in the central cup this weekend, right? That's right. The central cup. I oh. still have beef with you guys for not, uh, ranking my goal higher last year, but I was a fan of it. It was the one you were on the right side and shot upper ninety, yeah. right? Yeah, was it was it Geo? Geo voted me down. It's Geo. I mean, he's not even here, so overruled. I I hereby declare yeah. Nick McDonald's goal of the twenty twenty Central Cup the <laughs> number one goal 
Nobody. Anybody overrules? It's done. It's you no win. One here. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Yeah. I'll I'll make sure I one up it on or on, on the twenty twenty one version. Yeah, I think so. This will be the twenty twenty one version. I have yeah. no idea. I have no. Yeah, I lost think, track of yeah. years about two marches ago. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> As far as I know, we're still stuck in March 2020, and it's the Groundhog's Day. We're just every day is the yeah, same day, exactly. we're just over and over. Um, yeah. That should be interesting because we, so everyone saw the schedule and everyone looked at it. And we're like, oh yeah, they're playing there. Oh yeah, they're gonna do a round robin. And then we finally looked at it and said, oh, they're not doing a round robin. Like neither yeah. of the M1 teams are playing. You guys aren't playing St. Louis, and Wings aren't playing the Kings. It's all cross games. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what. What's the deal with that? I don't know. Did you see our Instagram post today, though? No, I didn't. You know, you gotta go look at it. I think it might be a story. We got a we got a trophy from last year, apparently. Oh, you did. Yeah. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I almost never open up Instagram. Yeah. I don't even. Yeah, I I had it. I used it once, and and I used it haven't once, used it since. Yeah. I don't know how to use it. Where am I here? Oh, this one? No, that's not it. I can send it over to you guys. We got a nice shiny trophy. Yeah, send it over. Because I... I'm... But it, w- Just it don't, was... Don't throw it away. Uh, Keep it. And hey, don't throw it away. Yeah. Like if someone sent you a corn dog trophy they had custom made <laughs> and they sent to you out and some stayed out once when the West Coast and it found its way in a dumpster somewhere. Don't do that. Yeah. Not that that no, happened. It's in our nice, uh, our nice brand new locker room. Nice. We got a nice little trophy case. So. So the first two things in the locker room were trophy case and then sunflower stickers on Sosa's locker. That's right. <laughs> As it should be. That's awesome. So wait. So. But it, but, Adam, since you uh, gave Nick the, the goal of 2020 Central Cup, shouldn't you send him a trophy so he can put it in the trophy case? I, I, I do owe, I do, so Joey, I do owe you another corn dog, and I'm staring at the pile of them over here. Um, so what I did is I had two boxes set up, and I closed the boxes up. One of them had one corn dog in it, and one of them had two. And then I closed them up and I had two labels printed and I told my wife, I'm like, here, ship these out and didn't really necessarily tell her which box had two. And at the time didn't even know which one had two. So I kind of guessed and some lucky fan got two corn dogs and you got one. So that's the way that shook out. (laughs) It's all good. I mean, the other ones for um, Andrew or Nick, whichever one wants it the most. Well, Andrew's not here. So (laughs) I mean, (laughs) Yeah, or you can send two more, and we'll just make sure you both can get one. Yeah, I, I need to. I need to send. So I need to. Send, I have five right now, and I think now, I think all five are spoken for, and I do not have boxes or, uh, I don't have boxes for any of them. So, it's I, all good. I don't think sticking a UPS why label just, just on the you, fluffy. Adam, corn. Why don't you just? Why don't you just take a drive down and deliver it to them? You're closer than I am. Yeah, I'll be back. I mean, not now. Oh, not oh, now. oh, oh. Not now? Okay. Yeah, after the show. Okay, I'll be, okay. <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll be up in Milwaukee on New Year's Eve, so. Well, there we go. Yeah, yeah. We just have to smuggle it in the arena, and we'll be fine. <laughs> there you go. They have their new, so you can't carry a bag in that's bigger than four by six by one inch, which is, I don't know what kind of bag you can get that's that big. It's it's all the arena safety rules and things. Yeah. So when uh when is the M three season starting? About I know the schedule isn't out yet. Um, the schedule isn't out yet, but we have our first uh, game confirmed, and we'll be playing the Springfield Demise in Springfield on December eighteenth. And um, we will be starting the season there, and then our next our then. The rest of the games will be that February into um, January into February. Okay. Cool. Looking forward to it. Yeah. Um, this year should be interesting since we have Heartland um, Division, and then they're adding the uh, Northeast Division this year, which is going to be a lot of uh, teams from the New York, Philadelphia, Maryland area. 
which could be kind of interesting to see what they're going to do and how they're going to shape out the postseason. Yeah, I'm hoping um, hoping we get to the point where all the leagues have their everything set up in advance. Like, uh, you know, like the MSL for the first year, the MSL has been in existence. They finally have the playoff format announced well before the season starts. And uh, I know I, I, as we come out of COVID, it'll get better. Yeah. I think, but uh, I think this year we're still in kind of a, you know, there's still arena issues, there's facility yeah. issues. But hopefully. I mean, this this year for scheduling, I'll say that one of the biggest things was arena issues. Uh, one of the teams in our conferences was struggling to get a facility um, because of the COVID regulations and everything. I'm not going to say who, but there was um, one team that was struggling there and they were considering on playing all their games on the road. That's where it, it's still kind of a rough spot for arenas around. Yeah. Um, it worked for one MASL team, I guess. And so, you know, <laughs> proof that you can win everything on the road or. Huh. It's true. It's kind of rough. A, de- yeah. compl- a completely different atmosphere for all the players are not staying at home. And yeah, it's been a weird, it's been a weird couple of years. Yeah. That's, that's, I'm just, I'm waiting for games again. I'm waiting for games I can go to. The last actual game I went to was the All Star game, so it's gonna be a, oh, yeah. it's gonna be a year in a couple of weeks here, and then that was it since March of twenty twenty. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I had my well. I had my fix in April, so I'm ready. Yeah, I wanted to go there. I wanted to go down, to, I, and we were gonna go down to we we're gonna try to go to KC this year, and just looking at the schedule, it didn't really work out, and then yeah. um. We're gonna take the trip to San Diego. We figured, hey, KC plays on the Friday night, and the Wave doesn't play until Sunday. We'll just go in on Friday, watch the game. While well, my wife has a concert here in town that she's going to, so Imagine uh, Dragons beats Kansas City at San Diego. I guess. So sorry, guys. Rough. That's okay. <laughs> yeah, no, my, so, my so Nick, let me. Go ahead. Nick, let me ask you. So you guys are gonna be playing a special game. Uh, sometime in January, right? Uh, Kansas City versus Tacoma. Um, how how awesome is oh, that? Yeah. I mean, it's going to be like the that's where all the MASL, the heads of the MASL are going to be there, and it's like a big big conference. Yeah. And, and what do you? Yeah. So, do you, um, do, do you guys know about the the coaches conference, the United Soccer Coaches Co- Conference? Yeah. Um. Yeah, so it'll be during that, and obviously the T-Mobile Center, which it used to be called the Sprint Center, but that's that's our big arena in town. You know, that's where like Taylor Swift and all the, all the big uh, performers perform. So um, I always say the last time I went to T-Mobile Center was for a Taylor Swift concert. So somehow um, you led with Taylor Swift, and I'm I'm impressed and yeah. disgusted all at the same time. So. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. uh, but um, yeah, no. So, I mean, it's it's gonna be very exciting. I mean, there should be a lot of a lot of fans there um, with all the coaches in town. I mean, I don't know the exact number of coaches that come to this convention, but it's it's a lot. Um, we travel all over the country. Um, I think the last one I went to was in Baltimore, maybe or Pittsburgh. Or Philadelphia, Philadelphia. We got there in the end. It was in Philadelphia, <laughs> but um, it should be fun. It should be a good game. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing that for sure. I, you know, on the stream with all the people, and I, we've always said, you know, bring a sports fan to an indoor soccer game, you'll make them a yeah. fan of indoor soccer. And I think this is just the everyone knows it's out there. Everyone knows what it is. All the soccer coaches know what it is. I don't think they know the level that it can really be. Yeah, no, I would I would agree, and hopefully that gets um, some more eyes on it. And uh, obviously, in a bigger venue like that, it should be it should be exciting. And I think we announced a bunch of stuff. Um, some of our games will be playing on TV and um, on the radio and stuff like that. So Bud's doing a Brian Bizinski, our owner, our, um, is doing a really good job. I've year, heard of so. him. He's a good guy. 
He's a good guy. He bought me a drink once, so. Got nothing bad go. to say about him. <laughs> yeah, definitely a good guy. Though. Yeah, he's a good guy. Yeah. He made me a KC fan. I mean, it took that. It took some doing, but it happened. There you go. The, the rival team. Yeah, I know. It's going to be weird this year because I didn't have anyone to root for, so I kind of picked you guys and, and a little bit of St. Louis because, you know, Max Ferdinand was there and some other players. But uh, yeah, oh, it's, it's a game on now. The last time will be nice to you for at least until May or so. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> I'll, still, I'll still be nice to you. Don't worry. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> until you go into Utica yeah. and beat UCFC. <laughs> Yeah, no, they're not, they're not coming to yeah, Utica. We we're not going there, so uh, we yeah. have, I got no beef with KC this year. All right, That's I have them. Bad. I have them. I have them win in the central. There we go. All right, well, time to go. <laughs> right, I do too. I, I I wish we were going back to Utica. The last time we went there was. Uh, no, was no, we're not. We're not. Uh, no, the, that's that's a game we're not going to discuss. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, that was an awful game. I, I will say the first the first half of that game was certainly awful. It was terrible. Uh, you, no, no. The first the, half was great. <laughs> the, the first three quarters were great. That would say first three uh, quarters, just, yeah. And then and then the, the guy named Robert Palmer just decided to, to take over and, and, and yeah. But you know we're yeah. not going to talk about it because that's that's. That's not he's, why we're here. Yeah. Yeah. He's not even on the comments anymore, so. <laughs> yeah. That is he's true. got his I still mention it to him. Yeah. Uh, anything, uh, as we wrap okay. up here, anything uh, you want the fans to know about Sunflower, about uh, any of the other programs you guys are running, anything about KC, anything? Um, I'd just say just be on the lookout for um, announcements coming up in the next uh, three to four months where we might be having a few surprises here and there. So um, I'll just be looking out for our social media, Facebook and Instagram. I'm not going to spoil any surprises for you, but we have in a, we're working on a few things in the background over here and we're trying to make um, the uh, sp- the amateur slash my like soccer scene, um, a little bit more exciting in the Kansas City area. Cool. Uh, and one yeah. thing, so okay. I, was, oh, sorry. I was gonna say yeah. one thing to mention is that um, we're starting our youth program this past uh, season, and um, there's one thing that we're gonna be trying to expand on is uh, youth development. I think we've been, we've talked about that a bunch, and Geo is a big. Uh, was the big the first big advocate for having youth programs uh, like all the way you know sponsored by the clubs, and we can grow the players right into the clubs, and you know it just kind of works out um, for everyone that way. Definitely a fan of that that idea. Yeah, our big vision with Sunflower, to be honest, is that we want like most team club teams around the Kansas City area, they go all the way up to high school, but then there's really not much past high school. And so our thing is that it would be really cool if we had a kid that's maybe five, six, seven, who works his boy all the way up the ranks, gets to play, and then gets to play for us. And then just doesn't get to, like, go somewhere else, but actually winds up playing for us in the end. And in, you see that in a lot in, in English um, teams over in Europe and Spanish teams and stuff. And one of the – inspiration behind was when I was in college, uh, the first time I went to Apple, uh, I a few Americans there and a lot of the internationals that I played with went through an academy system where they played for a team when they were like five or six and they wanted to play for them when they were like 21, 22, 23. That's cool. Yeah, those are always those are always cool stories. We need more of that in the U.S. There's, there's no path right now. You yeah. know, you can play on 17 different club teams and then maybe a high school and a college and then maybe something after college and then, bam, you wind up in the MLS and no one knows who you, where you came from and there's no name. It'd be nice to have, like, you know, the, the see the, like the old videos of Messi when he was, like, seven years old and eight years old just dribbling around everybody. You need to see something like that from a U.S. player, you know, from day yeah. one up. 
And the old old boys, yeah. Uh, I actually went to Argentina and um, we played against um, his academy team. Oh, cool. I think I was in in high school with like the regional team or the youth national. I don't know some one one of those teams. How do you do in ODP? Uh, I think that game. I think we tied that game, but I think we won two, tied one, lost one. Oh, that's that's but good. I mean, yeah, I mean they were they were incredible though. They were incredible. I was just so uh, so impressed. I remember I heard, watching I them. They uh, voted, I heard you scored a goal, and it was the the goal of the tournament. So <laughs> yeah, I don't know about that. I broke my nose the first game though. Oh. Uh, that was funny. I subbed in, and uh, like I, I think I was on the field for maybe thirty seconds, and this guy elbowed me in the nose, and I broke it. And like bled all over our white jersey and had to stub out. Like, so. a little playing experience here and there doesn't hurt. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh Charles, do you got anything you want to say? Um, not nothing from my end. Um kinda like Joey said, just be on the lookout for, for all our social media. Um hopefully have some some big news to share with you guys here in the next couple of months. Yeah. I mean, uh all I would say is I mean, Charles and Charles and Joey and Andrew and all these guys do a great job of making this possible. Um, I mean, I think there's definitely a need. Or I, I, what I vision in the future is there being multiple different tiers of indoor soccer, and there's there we're definitely on the right path. And so, um, hopefully, the game can just keep growing. Um, and so. Without these guys, none of this will be possible. All I do is just set up cones and uh, talk crap on the goalies. There you go. But, I mean, yeah. it's an honest uh, day's work, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I hope they're in here listening to this because I told yeah. them I would, I would crap on them. I haven't seen any chat yet. Yeah. Um, one thing I would like to say is that though this isn't possible without our sponsors, so I would like to thank um, Neuromics, um, Jared Williams, How Healthcare Works, and um, um, Auto Frentes. Um, the, these organizations that come in help us with our funding and help us um, support from a marketing perspective and help us out. These are the reasons that we're able to continue our mission, do what we can, and things like um, having partnerships with Challenger and stuff and having different ways of growing our club has really been um, a unique perspective because most clubs are either funded by someone who has a lot of money or they're, they basically have come out of thin air and or to come from some grant our club is basically organic from a bunch of people who believe in our club believe in our mission and believe in our team and that's the most interesting part about it is that this club was built on the tr trust that we had the right um, t um people involved to be able to make this thing so successful that it's been so far yeah it's it's good to hear it's good to hear a lot, a lot of good community support. There's some teams out there that are really doing it right, and I think you guys are definitely one of them. Uh, I guess say we, I'd say we try. Um, at times, I, I'd say that we don't always feel like we're succeeding, but at the same time, it's a lot of hard work to get this to where it is right now. We have a lot of people that aren't getting paid to do this. They're just doing it for the love of it, and hopefully one day – we can see this thing really grow to its potential where everyone gets in with gets out what they put in. Yeah, I I have no doubt. I I'm a fan. Yeah. So yeah. uh we'll get corn dogs out to your way at some point soon before the end of time. And uh uh I thank yeah. you guys a lot for joining. I uh, really yeah. appreciate yeah. it. And we'll yeah. get you on, maybe we'll get you on early next year when the season's still going on. Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. Sounds awesome. Hopefully we can uh we can send you guys one of our new jerseys if they ever, yeah, if they ever get here. Yeah, let me know. Let me know. I like I said, I I, I like to support the team, so let me know. I'll buy one. Yeah, yeah not, uh, not, not Geo though. Not Geo though. Right.
Yeah, definitely. He's never definitely. here when we're on. <laughs> Go yeah, ahead. but if you guys are ever in town, um, feel free to catch an M3 game. It might not be as fancy as an M1 or M2, but it's definitely entertaining. Yeah, definitely. We'll have to plan on. Absolutely. We'll have to figure out a weekend that works between, like, maybe catch an M1 game and and a M3 game in the same weekend. Yeah, that'd be awesome. That'd be worth a trip for sure. All right, cool. Thanks, guys. No problem. Really appreciate you, it. Guys. Have a good night. Oh, we're going to take a quick time out. We'll be right back. Next weekend. Hello, we are back. I am uh, attempting to send a link to Mr. Tavernisi, and then we're going to talk some uh, goalkeeper rule changes. And Eric, when in doubt, time out. <laughs> Jack says the angry segment of the show is coming up. Um, no, I, I, I don't think so. I, I, don't, um, I don't know. I... So let me kind of state something before Joey gets on, and, and if Joey's kind of watching, he can, he, he can understand. Oh, here he is. Actually, wait a minute. All right, let me see if I can figure this out. Oh, well, while you're doing that, I'm, I'm going to let everyone in on part of the Fanatic transformation. Oh. <sighs> <sighs> What are we looking at? You're just all dressed up and famous and stuff? Or... It's a really nice looking suit there. Yeah. So it, it, it's going to have pants as well. I hope so. But this is... Joey, what do you think? That's fantastic. What? Can you guys hear me? Barely. Uh... Hear me now? Yeah, yeah you're yeah. just a little quieter. If I can yeah, boost I you. have I I've decided to ditch uh the blue hair, but I will bring it if you need a 
if you need a prop this year, Joey, I will bring the blue hair just for you. I appreciate it. First, let me let me say from from myself and Hannah, welcome back. Thank you. Happy to be. Yeah, I told I told Hannah today, and and she was over the moon, and she said she's going to wear the the Peter Pan hat um, to games. So I'm looking forward to it. Nice. So we uh, th th did you hear any rumor of something happening in the league today? Yeah, I spoke to too many people about it. I've only been back for less than a week, and I'm already digging myself a hole here. <laughs> All right, so let, let me kind of just state some things. When you guys see my posts and my on the show, I may be slightly playing things up just a little bit. I'm very passionate about this sport. I like to play a lot of different angles of issues. So my first reaction when the goalkeeper rule came out, or, or the talk of it came out, we were talking to Everton last year in the whole Stella Gate scandal, and uh, he mentioned this rule, and we talked about it, and I talked about it with Mark Litton, and it seemed like, oh, well, that seems interesting. I don't know if our, if our team would like it, because, you know, we have the goalkeeper with arguably the best feet in the league, but it's interesting. And then when I saw the, the, the games over the COVID season, I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, this has to go. Like, like we, I don't want to watch. And, and to, to quote Everton, he said, we signed Max Ferdinand for a contract. People are coming to the stadium to watch Max Ferdinand play. They're not watching, you know, Paulo touch the ball 47 times in the first five minutes. They're not watching him touch the ball in the first quarter more than Max will touch it the entire game. You know, so I think – when that started, I, I just I, it started like, oh, you know what? Something needs to change. And I didn't know what. Um, I didn't know if I liked the idea of the whole, you know, futsal rule identical to what futsal was doing. So uh, didn't really know. And then talks about it about a month ago came out when it when it kind of leaked from the league that it was it was happening. And I had probably seven or eight goalkeepers reach out and just they hate it. They just we hate it. It's going to ruin the game. It's going to do this. It's going to do that. And we, so we were hoping that it didn't happen. And of course, the the famous uh, "Let the goalies kick the ball" song, uh, which was more of like a think of that as like a weird Al prank parody song than anything anything really you know musical or it's not like a like a statement piece or anything like that. I just kind of had a joke and a fun with it, you know fun with it. Um, but then it came out today, and I, of course, Messenger and Facebook and everything blew up. And um, Joy, I saw some of your posts, and I was like, "Well, here's the first like yours was the first person other than Everton that that was positive about it." I went through like 250 negative comments, and then there's your, "Hey, this is good for the game." And I like to think I like to try to understand things from both sides of of an argument, in most cases. And when I started reading it, I started thinking about it, and I still wasn't really convinced. And then I got the message from Commissioner Tozer saying, hey, we need to talk before you go live on your show tonight. You may not have the whole story. So 5 p.m. I talked to Tozer for a half an hour, and uh, kind of I'm still on both sides of it, but I understand both sides much more. Um, I understand this side more than as, at least as much as the other side now. So Joey, what's your before I get into what we talked about with Tozer? What's your for those of you who have no idea what I'm talking about? Uh, the MSL has implemented a rule that are going to change the goalkeeper rules. So the goalkeeper can only touch essentially touch the ball once per possession. Um, once they distribute it by foot, they cannot touch it until it goes out of bounds, a stoppage of play, or an opponent touches the ball. If they distribute it by their hand, either throwing it or rolling or whatever. Um, they can have it played back to them once, and then once they pass it, uh, they cannot do that. The other thing is that as soon as they get past midfield, which is now allowed in all fourth quarters, uh, did get that confirmed today that that rule, you know, the goalie not being able to cross midfield until fourth quarter, that rule is gone. Um, so they can go anywhere in the field they want at any time. Once they hit midfield, they're a regular player. They can touch the ball whenever they want, however long they want, and as often as they want. So that's the rule. So, Joey, I've talked for a while, so tell me what you think. Yeah, so, um, I mean, we spoke briefly, but um, I think change always causes controversy. Um, listen, I was a big fan of three points and two points. 
back in the day. And everyone, oh, we got to go one point. We got to be soccer, blah, blah, blah. The truth is, like, I love this game. I've been in love with it since 2011. We are secondary to every other major sport. So if you want to do something to get your sport noticed, sometimes you need to make changes. So I hated the rule of threes and twos going away. But you know what? I had to deal with it. And to be fair, I don't think I ever scored a three-pointer in my career. So why the hell would I care about three-pointers, right? But at the same point in time, it was good for the game because I remember games against Syracuse when I was with Rochester. We'd be down eight goals, and then Mauricio would score two three-pointers, and we're right back in it. You know, I lost the opposite way. Marcus Chantel hit a banger on us with no time left. We were up two. He scored a three-pointer. We lost. So, like, people don't like change because they're so used to what they're accustomed to playing with or doing, right? So my issue is when I first played futsal, and I played a little bit of futsal Oh, we lost That's Joey. Okay. Yeah. But for, for, the, for, for the record, that Marco Chantel goal was really, really good. And, and they got revenge. They got revenge. I don't know if it was that year or the year after, but the three-point the three point goal actually came into play. Um, Rochester beat Syracuse in the playoffs 3-2. Uh, to two. And if it was one point, it would have been one-to-one. One. Yeah, but that that three point goal was probably one of the best goals I've ever seen, and I think for the record, Joey has never scored a three point goal ever. <laughs> oh, he's coming back. Yeah, we can. I had to get that out out there before he came back. Oh, it's a little tight. We're 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 still live, right? Of half then like i'm now gonna have to chase around josh and william and so, I, I can't and Danny. hear Joey, we can't hear you i can hear him i can't oh boy you know what let's do a let, sorry guys let's do a timeout and i'll just we'll just redo the whole thing i'll send new links in a second we'll be back. all right
back we are live you guys hear each other okay yep. yeah we're good all right welcome back so um you were just kind of talking about like the skill level of the players and how they're gonna shine yeah so i mean i think some of the guys that you know you're already accustomed to seeing being really good players um they're gonna impress you even more because it takes a lot to get out of that pressure when you can't just constantly play the ball back to the goalie Right. But then at the same point in time, someone like me is still going to struggle once they cross half like you would in futsal because Josh, William are still going to get into the half. Like, I mean, knowing Jules and knowing Milwaukee, Josh is going to cross half a lot. And they're going to, and you know what? That's fine. Josh is awesome with his feet. And that's, you know, that's the game style, the game plan that they're going to go with and the style of play they're going to play. But, like, if you run down the league, you can't really find too many goalkeepers that aren't good with their feet, you know? So I understand their frustration, and I, if I was a goalkeeper, I would probably be a little bit annoyed as well because you're essentially taking half field of me out of the game. But if you're good enough to work the ball into the attacking half and then think about when your defense is on the opposite side of the field, when you're trying to change and your bench is on the far side, you're going to be playing six V five and you're not going to give that opponent any chance to change. You're going to keep changing because your bench is going to be in your attacking half and the defense is going to be stuck on while you're playing six V five. I mean, I could personally argue as a field player, like I don't want to have to chase six V five the whole game. So I don't think goalies should be allowed to leave their box. You know, you could play devil's advocate with so many different things. They've made a rule. Do I think the beginning of the season is going to be a little helter-skelter? Yes. Are referees going to have trouble with the rules? For sure. Are players going to forget the rule at a time and maybe make a mistake? Definitely. But you're going to see attacking restarts, top-of-the-box restarts. You're going to see more goals inevitably because people are going to give the ball away in the back. I mean, I played in the back in futsal. I'm by no means a good dribbler. I gave the ball away a ton, but you got to figure out how to get out of it. you got to adapt and learn how to play the game. The game has just evolved. Whether people like the rule or not, whether people like my view on it or not, it's there. So are you going to just sit there and complain about it? Or if you're that good with your feet, like Josh and William are, your team should work the ball above half and then come out, come play 6v5. Now my team is going to have to figure out how to deal with you because you're just as good of as a field player as you are a keeper with your feet. So I, I think people don't want to see it because, yes, they love goalkeepers in this game, and goalies are arguably the most important position in this game. I, I'll go out there and say it. If you have a really good goalie, you're probably going to win. You know, like that's how it works in this league because they're so important. There's so many shots. But at the same point in time, like I want to see, you know, Marcio dribble me out of the back because he's that creative or that good. Like, and if I can defend him, then that's my job to make it hard for him. So 
I think you're going to see a lot more creativity. I think you're going to see a lot more movement, passing, pattern play, which I personally love about the game. I think you're going to see a ton of skill, people beating guys 1v1 out of the back, which is cool to see. And then certain teams are going to work their player above half. You know, like, it, it's a rule. It's implemented. Hate it or love it, like my view on it or dislike it. We're going to have to deal with it this season. And for me, who's going to adapt best to it, right? Like, who knows? Maybe at Utica, we suck with it. And I love the rule, but it doesn't fit into our style or our players, right? But, like, at the end of the day, we got to figure out a way to get around it. It may be the greatest thing for Milwaukee or it could be the worst thing for them. But at the end of the day, they're going to have to figure out how can they change it. You know, a lot of teams are probably going to high press. So then are you going to throw it long every time? I mean, I could argue we sh I don't like the rule throwing the ball three lines because Boris threw the ball to Tavoy every single time in our semifinal game, and he's an absolute monster, and we couldn't get the ball off him. So I don't like that rule. I don't think we should be able to throw it three lines. That's how we lost the semifinal, in my opinion. You know, like, you could argue everything. So – my issue with it, I think, is people need to kind of just accept it and figure out a way how to be good with it. Josh get over half and score goals like he's done in the past. And the rest of us figure out ways how to get out of the back without playing back the goalkeeper. And that's kind of my overall view and take on it. I don't want it to become like a debate and argument. It's implemented. I think it makes the game harder. I think better players are going to shine and thrive. And it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out. But I definitely think you're going to see more goals because you'll see counterattacks from teams getting broken down from high pressing. And you'll see cheap goals from people giving the ball away in the back. Yeah. I, so there were a number of things that I, when I, when I started talking about this, even, you know, we started talking about this a couple of weeks ago on the show was <clears throat> like, why wouldn't you run this? The, the main question I had and, and I posted I posted this to Everton. It's like, the rule aside, the main question I had is, why are you implementing this at the top level of the league right away? Like, why wouldn't you play test? It's just exactly what Brad just said. Why wouldn't you play test this in the M2 or the M3 first? Um, the, the number one answer to that, and, there, and like I said, I talked to Tozer for a while. Number one answer to that is that right now there's only 12 teams in the league. And wouldn't it be a better time to do this when there's only 12 teams than when there's 20 or 24 or 32 or how many ever are going to be in the future. Um, and we both agreed that, you know, last year probably would have been a perfect time to play test this, but the three, you know, the big three weren't in the league at the, at the point. Um, the thing that got, it was interesting to me. I started asking the questions about how this was tested, what you did, uh, what kind of research was done, things like that. So it was tested in both the M2 and the M3 at a tryout session. And uh, what they, actually, let me back up a second. What they first did is they took like half a dozen games and somebody edit out all of the passes back to the keeper and then count them and agree on how many were. And uh, in a average game, just a you know, 60 minute non overtime game, there were pass back to the goalie over 100 times per keeper. So between the two teams, over 200 times per game, the ball was passed back to the keeper. And that was the main thing they're trying to eliminate with this rule. Um, they've talked to a number of people about who are both players, coaches, former players, uh, experts in the game, and they all kind of agreed, yes, this is an issue we need to we need to figure out. Like this whole issue of why the goalie is playing the ball so many times, that's a huge problem. When they tested an M2 and M3, uh, they did it like at a tryout. So they had some normal M2 players, some M3 players, some amateurs. They had kind of all the skill levels involved. And they said, okay, first half, just go out and play. Normal everyone played. And they had someone counting stats. There were 90 passes back to the keepers, which go in line with those same, you know, those same numbers. And the score at the end of 30 minutes was one to one. And then at halftime, the, the coach kind of called them over and said, you know what, I'm looking for players that want to move forward and I want to move back. So for the second half, let's just say you can only pass back to the goalkeeper once per possession. Basically the rule. They didn't say it was going to be a rule, but they said it was going to be, we're just going to try this. And hey, Matt, your audio is like really awful. Yeah, yeah, I know. Hang on. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I'm going to hop off. All right. 
what they so what they did is they they second half they played the rule without telling them that like this is we're going to be a rule in the season or anything like that they just said hey this is what we want you to try and see what happens and the, the score at the end you know they didn't they didn't pe- count the pass backs because they didn't need to and the score was 6 to 6 granted it's a one time test it's a sample size of one, which anyone who's in any kind of statistics know it's not a, a, a sample to get like real data out of. But then the, the, the talk to the players was a bit different. And uh, he didn't give me names and I didn't ask for them. So he said, one of the, one of the, guys, one of the players said, well, it was weird because I had to think about what I was going to do with the ball before I got the ball. And Keith is like, well, I tell my eight-year-olds that. <laughs> like, like I have U8 players that I tell. That's what you need to do. You need to figure out what you're going to do with the ball before you get the ball because it's all planning ahead. Um, he had one goalkeeper say, I'm used to touching the ball 70, 80 times a game. So, I'm, so this was different, and I don't really like it, but I definitely understand why you're doing it. And there was another goalkeeper who said, this took all the stress off me because now... I know my team can't just dump the ball back to me when they're in trouble and put me in trouble. And then I have to make the magic move to get out of trouble. Um, I thought those were interesting comments. Um, the, you know, they made the comment, Oh, we did research. We did this and everyone kind of jumped to the conclusion. Oh, there was no research on. They just made this up and things like that. So I thought it was interesting um, that, that the actual, uh, Matt, we need to, we we can have a bake sale to buy you a phone if you want. I we can make cookies and brownies and cupcakes and stuff like that, and then all proceeds go to Matt's new phone. Uh, he's in the chat. I don't know if you can see that, Joey, but uh, yeah. So so that was the that was the research and that was the testing they did. Uh, they did a number of other tests um, along with the glass up tests. So they took the same number of games that they looked at the goalkeeper and they looked at how many times the ball went out of bounds between the yellow lines where the glass is now down. And how many would have stayed in bounds if it was up? And it was 25 times a game that the ball would have stayed in play versus going out of play. And so I think we're going to see Glass up come back. Uh, some of the other things he said, he said 15 years ago when he had Victor Naguer in the game, he said Victor wanted the ball all the time. And Keith, as Victor's coach, wanted to change the rule then, even though it was his own player. And he was obviously dominant with his feet and dominant on the field. thought that was interesting. Um, he brought up the NBA rule, the Sha- kind of the Shaq rule, three-point rule, and then the uh, NH- NHL Marty Brodeur rule where they essentially created, a, you know, like, goalies can't go into this section. Um, I thought it was interesting. At the end of our conversation, I did tell him, I'm still on the fence. I don't know which one I want. I want to see it before I, before I, you know, take any any type of opinion on it. I do think, like you say, the first uh, – especially the first couple of games, like the games this weekend for the Central Cup, where the rule will be in, fa- in effect, are going to be uh, Helter Skelter is probably a, a generous term <laughs> for what's going to happen. But uh, I think there's going to be some issues there. Um, I think uh, there's, there are a couple other rules that I wanted to go over, though. Um, the goalie passing midfield rule is now gone, so the goalkeeper can go anywhere they want the whole time. Um, the keeper can roll the ball or throw the ball to someone and they can play it back to him and it's okay. That that doesn't count as a first touch of rolling. Um, the goalkeeper, I think you're going to see more. And we used to see this eight to 10 years ago or so where the goalkeeper gets the ball, walks up to the top of the box and then throws it down and runs out with it. Um, I see the Mexican goalies doing that more often. Guys like Marcel Feenster and Nick Vorberg used to do that on the wave a lot. And we see it every once in a while, but we see it more as an opportunistic play where the goalkeepers just happen to see like a gap and they go, oh, forget it. I'm just going to take off with it. Um, we, you can do that. And then your first pass can go and you can go up to midfield and, and get back. Um, right. Another thing that's going to be gone is this weird thing. If you've ever seen like the ball goes you know, over the keeper's head and the keeper grabs the ball because it falls down off the net and then he gives it to the ref and the ref makes him go and stand back on the ba- on the back line before he gives it back to him. Or if the goalkeeper tries to throw it, then the ref blows the whistle. He goes, no, you have to give it back to me and then I have to give it back to you. They're getting rid of all that nonsense. So as long as the goalkeeper's in the box, he can take the ball and then distribute it. Uh, and I think that's just a, it's a little tweak to the rule that I think will help a lot. Just that weird, like, why can't he, you know, why can't he use the ball? Like, why is he not allowed to touch it or whatever? 
Oh, Matt, we're getting your video back here. <clears throat> Just to see if it works. Seems good right now. Um, but the the one thing that that and and I I have um I have a certain goalkeeper I won't name by name, but he did say that uh, he may Joey he may or may not make you chase over the half a lot, and then when he scores, he'll dedicate it to you and. <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm all fun in the games you know like i said listen for me anything that can make the game whether we like it or not as players or like really close fans anything that can make the game more appetizing to outside people who may not be in the indoor circle i'm all for it. so i think if there's more goals you're gonna see more of that hey now you might see a goalkeeper score in the first quarter and maybe someone thinks that's awesome that a goalkeeper scoring you know like the rules you're just saying all of those for me those are similar to futsal they make the game go quicker we don't want as many delays right that ball it's an edit pops back in he picks it up ref blows the whistle let's play like oh they're they're doing listen i'm i'm i've known keith for a while and i like what he is implementing um for me, it's just all better for the game. Whatever we can do to attract people is better for the game. Listen, if I was a goalie, I get their frustration. Do I want to give up more goals? No. Do I want to touch the ball more? Yes. But if you tell me that instead of watching Spike Ball and Cornell and Can Jam on ESPN, that indoor is going to be on ESPN because now we score 20 goals a game instead of nine or eight goals a game, then Okay, I'm all for it. Like, it, this is where I'm, where I see value in it, right? And I think it will bring more fans into the game. I think it will make the game better. Do I see their argument? Sure. Do I disagree with their argument? No. I just see it from my way that it can be a good thing for the game. Listen, like you said, there's 12 teams. Maybe it sucks. And at the end of, I'm not the kind of guy who's going to be like, no, the rule was still great. If the rule sucks, I'm going to say, you know what? I was wrong in the beginning of the season. I thought it was going to be good, and actually, it's not. So I, we should probably get rid of it. But like, I hope people keep an open mind where if they see more people interested in the game, or people are happy with the new score lines, or people are happy seeing those goalies score in the first quarter, like, then I hope they see the value in it that it's now promoting the game in a positive way which is i think what we all are looking for um so again listen i'm not here to like play one side or the other personally i'm i'm hoping and i think it will be good for the game and for the league it may turn out not to be and if it doesn't like i'll stand corrected that's on me um but i hope that it does do well for the game and you know, we all see the value and the positivity in it. I think I think out of that, I think Joey just said he wants MPS back. That's <laughs> that's what I got. That's what I got out of that. I I find it so so I mean uh Soccer Sam made a comment today saying, you know, hopefully this rule will help get you know all the fans back that left because of MPS you know, MPS leaving and I said, Yeah, I, both of them are over there in that other group complaining about stuff. Um, so I laughed at that, but, uh, one of the things you did say, so Tozer said, we're going to run it for a year there. They are running it in M2 and M3. That was one of the questions that I had. It seemed like because it came out at the MASL level, it wasn't really announced for M2 or M3. I wasn't really sure. And it seemed like, well, if you're going to run this at the top of the league and not do M2 and M3. That makes no sense to me at all. Um, ideally I would like to see it run through like, you know, NFL will run rule changes in the preseason like like right. preseason of 2021 for the for the fall season of 2022 but then again the answer to that was well there's this 12 game there's this 12 team situation that we're in and it's an opportune time to do it um what i do kind of want to do is i kind of want to say what you said um in like the strategy uh so tozer got into some strategy that me as like a hardcore fan didn't even get like he was saying a bunch of things i was like uh okay uh, but what he said, basically what happens now is, um, okay, so Matt said he's going to sign off now because his phone is bad. He says, Joey, welcome back. He'll stop by practice sometime next week and say hi person. So. Sounds good. 
Um, but yeah, so what Keith said was, he said what happens now is, you know, goalkeeper makes a save, catches the ball. Both defenders stay back. And what will end up happening is, you know, the goalkeeper will keep it to the count of four or seven or eight or how many, how many ever seconds the four count is for the four second thing. Um, that we know is in four seconds. <laughs> and, right. and then pass to one of the defenders. And then they'll slowly move up. And then if somebody pressures a defender, defender will pass usually back to the keeper. Keeper will go to the other side. And they may have 15 passes back and forth between before they even cross like the yellow line or even midfield. Um, he said what, uh, what they really want to do is they want to have the goalkeeper catch the ball and guys just take off down the field. And he, he called it a skip pass. But he said the goalkeeper fires like a bullet pass to the streaking player like the Ian Bennett or the Marcio or the Luan or the um, thinking CFC players that are fast and uh, like the Matt Huber and uh, the Joey Taranisi, <laughs> you know, <clears throat> guys that are making runs. Then I think what's happening now is there's a lot of people that are saying, well, the way the game is played now, this rule is going to break this game. And I think I agree with that, but I think that's kind of the point. I think the point isn't to take this rule as a square peg and shove it into the circle hole of this game is this game is to take this rule and expand the game and, and evolve it. And uh, someone said to me in, in, in a private chat saying, if you, um, hang on. So Alex said, if you keep making these solid arguments for the rule, I'm going to go after back and countermeasure counter memes to all the posts I made earlier today. Alec, you've been killing it on the memes. Just keep it up. Just keep churning them out. Cause whether, you know, that's what I like my feed. Anyone's friends with me on Facebook sees all these weird dad jokes and memes, and I will not apologize for any of them. And I will keep churning them out day after day after day after day. Um, but I think I think what the thing is, is that the game needs to evolve. And this rule is one of the ways to make it evolve. I think personally you take skilled players, and I'm, I'm going to name all the wave guys just because of, that's who I know. You take a Josh Lemos, you take a Marcio, you take an Ian Bennett, you take um, uh, Derek Hoffman, we got Tyler Turner, uh, former MLS uh, player in, and you let their skills kind of shine and reinvent the game as they go on, I think you're going to see some really amazing things. And I see in the future, I think the goalkeepers have more of a chance to be on the attack than they do right now. Yeah, they, they uh, listen, I think they will be, honestly, because they're going to, so, again, you got to think every team's going to have a different style, right? Like I said, like, I mean, San Diego had Marcio, and Marcio was so great for San Diego. But if you go back and watch those games, Tropics v. San Diego, they were literally throwing the ball long to Tavoy every time, and they had crisscrossing runners off him. Farber's very fast and creative and good. You know, they had other players coming in. Craig's obviously similar, creative, and, and intelligent. Like, that was a style they chose. So they chose to throw it long and make us have to turn and run back. If you're Milwaukee and you're really good, even though Josh only has one touch, if you run really good patterns and you have Marcio in the back, Okay, now you probably have easy ways of getting out of there because your keeper is that good, even only with his one touch, right? Or do you have a throw like, you know, someone like Otto Orff had that cannon where he would skip it into people. Okay, now maybe you have crisscrossing runs and you have people running and he's skipping it in off the board and right into his path, right? So like you have so many different ways to break out of this. It's really going to be how does your personnel fit it? And what is your style going to be to break out of it? You may start one, the first four games throwing it and then realize your players are good enough to play out of it and then start to play out of it. And then you may play a team that's super good at high pressing because you have someone super fast up top like Ian and you don't want to play short against him. So you choose to try and throw long, right? Like I like that there has to be different types of play and creativity and and things like that. It, it adds a bit of flair to the game. It adds a bit of excitement to the game that you won't see the same two type of patterns that you can run to break out of when always playing the goalie. You know, is the goalie going to go out wide and then we have to choose, are we going to defend him or let him go? You know, is he over the yellow or is he not? Or are they going to just run a basic, play it out, keeper either runs to him or the far defender runs to him and we bounce it out of that. Like, you know, there. This gives it so much more. So it adds such a different element to it that it gives people so much more creativity. I'm excited to watch certain players play out of the back. Like I really am, and you're going to see. Even I mean, listen, 
I watch highlights of like Juwan, Mello, Vinny in indoor and futsal, like absolutely use futsal movements where you, you step on the ball and you absolutely leave someone breaking their ankle. You're going to see that out of the back because I'm going to think he's going to roll it inside and I'm going to bite on it and he's going to change direction because he's so quick and good. And he's going to go up the line in the boards. And now I'm screwed. So like, you're going to see a lot more of this and it's going to be, it's going to be exciting. I, I think it will. Cause I'm telling you, you're going to see cheap goals in front of right in front of the goal from bad turnovers. And you're going to see really good counterattacks of people who are super good at beating that pressure. And they're going to be three on twos, four on threes, even two on ones all game long. And you will get that back and forth excitement and, you know, run and gun game that maybe the fans want to see, but the players don't. But at the end of the day, like you got to play a style that is exciting. People don't want to go to NFL games and watch some team run the ball every game. They don't, they don't want to see, you know, they, they love watching the warriors because they, they shoot threes nonstop. They love a team that is back and forth because it adds to dunks in basketball, right? Like, I mean, you could argue, and I know people don't like Baltimore's arena, but at Yankee Stadium, people hit home runs for fun. Then you go to Fenway and you run into the Green Monster. Like, I would argue that that's not fair. But at the end of the day, like, it's a different element in a different place, right? Like, I don't necessarily like Baltimore's field, but it's a different way of playing. And it makes you have to figure out a different style to play to win or be successful. And, you know, I've found it to be interesting there because I've played games where Baltimore have passed the ball around me and I'm running around in circles and they're doing it in such a tight area that I have nothing but respect for it. Other people are like, oh, it's so small. It's not fair. Okay, they were good at what they did with their field. Credit to them. You know, like we always kind of look on the negative side and trust me, I'm someone who previously all I did was look at negatives. But this is something that can be a positive and let's try and embrace it and see what we can do. And listen, at the end of the season, if it sucks, I'll be the first person to say, I stand corrected. I was wrong. I got no issues with that, but let's at least it, listen. It's a rule this year. Yeah. We've gotten no other way, but to deal with it. So let's try and make the most of it and see if we can turn it into something positive. There were, yeah. And I, and I agree. And, and I, I can't remember if I said this a little bit, but Tozer did say that, at the end of the year, they're definitely going to reevaluate. This is this is the plan is to hopefully evolve the game starting with this year. But he said if it completely flops and everyone hates it and viewership goes down, scoring doesn't change, the game doesn't change, and he and it doesn't do what he thinks it will, he'll be the, like you said, he'll be the first to admit it, and and the rule will be gone. He doesn't think it will, and and the only way to do it is to see and to try. And I think I, I think the first half of the season is going to be much different than the second half. Definitely. I would agree. Because, because I think people are going to get used to it and it, it's going to be a learning thing. And that was, that was my main concern. It's like, well, it's November 8th. You get your first game. I mean, your first real game is set, is Friday, four days from now that this is going to be used right. in. Um, now granted it's M1 versus M2 uh, preseason, but there's a cup behind it. There's a trophy. There's a, a real thing. And then, Three weeks from, I think it was three weeks from Friday, or is it two weeks from Friday? It's it's two weeks from Friday is the first regular season game in, in St. Louis. Um, right. And and St. Louis has other issues because they don't have a keeper right now. They have oh. a guy. They have a guy they signed for M three who's gonna who's, right now is their only keeper. Um, right. Okay. Because Paulo yeah. tore his ACL and Rafa's stuck in Brazil. Oh yeah. Right. Um. Yeah, I mean, listen, I'm with you. I think it might be a struggle in the beginning. And like I said, are the fans going to not fully know the rule, even the ones who are totally involved in the game? Probably. Are some of us players going to make mistakes? Probably. Are the refs going to make mistakes? Probably. But, yeah. you know, we'll deal with the growing pains and and go from there, you know? And like I heard everybody saying last year, well, whoever wins, it's an asterisk because – Milwaukee didn't play and Baltimore didn't play and whatever else. Like, all right, fair. But my argument was I thought those seven teams were extremely talented because by the end of the year, everybody signed everybody who was good. So those teams were 
very legit. So at the end of this year, if Utica doesn't win, I'm going to say I want an asterisk because nobody liked the rule. So <laughs> it doesn't count. You know what I mean? Right, like, yeah, yeah. That's what we're up against here. Right. So well, and- I would never be like that, but that's how that's how I view it. I mean, you've seen indoor fans, and I've tried to be. I, I have, I have personally over the last two years tried to be more positive. And it hasn't always worked. It, Seventy-five percent of the, fifty percent of the time, it's worked. Forty percent, okay, thirty tops. Uh, but with with something like this, and I, I've been I've been talking to a, a couple keepers, and I, I'm not going to name any names. You could probably guess who. Um, I'm still not sold on it. I'm I'm trying to be an advocate for what the league wants to do just because I'm in a position to be able to, to help if I want, if I can. Um, I will be the first, like last year, and, and you know, your boys in Florida put on the complete shit show of a, of a broadcast that first game, and I was all over it. Um, and they fixed it. They they went out of their way to fix it, and it, it got better. I will still jump all over things that I don't feel are right until I'm proven wrong. And then I'll say, you know what? I was wrong. It turned out to be good. So right now I'm still on the fence. There were two things that came up, um, maybe three. There were two two for sure that, that Keith said he wanted to address based on posts that he saw. And one was um, the substitution issue. Somebody said, oh, this is going to make substituting impossible. It's never going to work. And he brought up, like back in his day of playing and coaching, they never subbed three players at a time. Like they never had the time where they were able to take and give the goal, you know, give somebody the ball to just sit there and sub all the players off. He said, uh, and he, he'll, he said, you'll watch it now. They'll take a player all the way over on the left side, away, you know, on the other side of the bench. So opposite side of the bench, he'll have the ball. There'll be another player will run this way. They'll pass to him. And then the player will run in front of the thing to go all the way off and sub. He said, the subs are just going to have to be different. They're not going to be the same, but there's, it's not going to ruin substitutions. It's just going to be a different way of doing them. They're going to have to be done more on the fly and more cycle the players in and out. And the one closer to the bench is the one subbed out first rather than furthest. Right. So, you know, that I, I know that comment because I saw it. And one of the things that I was saying to that is I don't think that that really like, okay, maybe in some places like, yeah, Baltimore, it might be tough, you know, like, but in my mind, like in a normal setup, if you can get yourself out and then you just run a basic weave, you can sub people out. Like when the bench is on your side, closest to your attack, it won't be too hard. When it's further, it might be hard. But again, you have to be like, it's, it's going to be something that you have to work out. Like, can you be good enough to keep the ball and not turn it over to get changes? But at the flip side, if I'm on defense, can I recognize it? And can I press you when you're trying to change to try and win the ball? Right? Like there's always a flip side to each thing. Do I agree or disagree? I don't feel either way. I think what they're saying could be true and could be right. But I also think, again, like if I see you struggling and wanting to change, then I'm going to go. You know, like one of the comments was like, oh, you're going to be stuck defending for five minutes. Like I played against Baltimore and Milwaukee. I defended for five minutes when you could get the ball. You guys literally passed in a triangle while I tried to chase you. Like, I, I didn't come off for three and a half minutes because I couldn't win the ball and I don't change on defense. So I've been there already. Like, <laughs> you know, they they don't always see it that way because they're in control of it. But like I was chasing around Adriano, Pat Healy, Mike Looking Land, William, while well, they just kept the ball for fun around me. Like that wasn't fun for me either, having to chase those guys who don't give the ball away. That That's not what I want. I mean, you know, that, that's kind of – how it plays out. You know, same thing with Josh, Marcio, you know, back when Pablo was there. Like, that's not fun for me. And then I'm running around for hours, and then they kick it to Ian, and I got to run 50 yards, and the guy's 20 times faster than me already. So, you know, like, these are things that, like, people usually only choose to see it from their aspect. And I do see it from their aspect. It's not fair to them. It sucks for them. But for everyone else in the greater good of the league, I'm hoping – that it has a positive reaction and a positive enforcement on the game. I think for subs, you're going to see more. And you see it you see it once in a while, but I think you're going to see much more of the player going off on the short side of the bench and player coming on on the long side of the bench and making a run. And I think you're going to see much more of that coming sure. in. Because um, sure. right now it's just kind of helter-skelter in some places. 
where players don't know and then they come off and they jump off and they you know they're all over the place. Um, the other thing that that Keith wanted to make sure that I that I said something or I wanted to make sure I said something about what Keith said is he said um, he is going to Dallas in a few weeks to meet with the refs. They're going to go over film. They're going to go over rules. And he said the league is 100% taking responsibility for the refs to get this right. Because he said one of the comments was the refs are going to screw this. I mean, you said it. You know, we all kind of agreed. You know, are the refs going to screw this up? Yes. Um, he said it's the league is taking 100% responsibility on making sure the refs get things right. And they went to the refs and said, are you able to do this? Is it going to be an issue? And the refs said, no, we are able to do this. We will be able to do it. Proof is in the pudding or whatever bread. I think Keith actually said the bread is in the pudding. I don't know what that means, but so we'll see once it really happens and see what happens. But uh, I think, um, I think that's going to be, that's going to be huge for the league to finally come up and say, you know what? We own the fact that we're, it's our responsibility for what the refs do. And if the refs are consistent, the refs are making the right calls. And, uh, you know, there was there was something that I brought up today. Somebody was talking about sixth attacker. Another rule thing, it's the sixth attacker and the goalies are exactly 100% the same now. So the the sixth attacker can't touch the ball more than once past half, you know, be on the other side of half field as well as the goalkeeper. It doesn't matter. I brought up the fact that there's the rule that not many people know about where if it's a delayed blue card, as soon as the goalkeeper can make a run towards the bench, and as soon as he makes that run, a player can jump off the bench with no six attacker jersey on, and it's legal. Right. Yeah. The problem there is going to be how do they track him and how many touches he has. And uh, I'm just trusting that it, that the refs will do that because it, it, it's in the rules. If it remains in the rules, that's their job. Right. At that point, I feel like you should. I mean, yes. The ball might transfer back, back over to your defensive half, but I feel like you're going to be in the attacking half. Or you should be most of the time. Yeah. Yes, it, it might arise, but you should be. If you're in a delayed blue card, you should be trying to attack because once they get a touch on the ball, it's dead. Yeah. You know? Um, so, I mean, hopefully that doesn't become a, a big issue, but I can see that thing, but it probably yeah. won't happen too often. There's so few delayed blue cards, and there's so few times where people right. realize that that even is a rule because I've seen people. Yes. You know, like the announcers don't even know sometimes, and they're so oh, they're struggling to look for the six attacker jersey. They can't get it. They're not going to get it in time. Oh, they blew an opportunity, and then it's like, well, no, they could have just dumped the person on and and it just. Right. Oh yeah, yeah I forgot about it. Dead once the other team touches it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So I think I've gone over. Yeah. The the other comment that I kind of wrote is is uh. The intention of this game is to change the underlying pl way players think about moving the ball. This has a potential to have the goalkeepers more involved in the game than less involved. If you if you evolve with the thing, and I'm going to say this, I, I I told him I was going to say some things directly to him and some things not. This is directly to him. Um, I'm still not 100% sold on this. So let's uh let's see what happens and and just uh yeah. kind of play with it and and. It's gonna. It's going to happen. I think is the. Is all the players are professionals. They're athletes. They're you know sports have been evolving for thousands of years as it is. This is just another evolution of the game. It can't stay the same forever. People are going to get better, faster, stronger. You know the whole thing. Um, so I think. Uh, I think it's. I think the idea of making the game and evolving the game is good, because I don't think the game is perfect in the way it is. There is no. Uh, and there shouldn't be a perfect game. There shouldn't because if 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 it's perfect, then there would be sellouts at every single arena. There were, you couldn't buy tickets. You wouldn't be able to do it. It would be on TV, you know, broadcast worldwide. That there there is no perfect sport. I'm a big big F1 fan. There were 140,000 people in Mexico for the for the Grand Prix yesterday, and I'm I'm a Mercedes fan. And Mercedes couldn't keep up with Red Bull. It, this is 20 seconds behind Max at the end of the race, I don't even know if you know what I'm talking about, but you know, there, here's a, you know, three or $4 million cars that are so much better than one another that they can't compete with each other. So no, the perfect sport isn't perfect. If it was perfect. All the cars would be the same and it would be completely up to the drivers. If soccer was perfect, you wouldn't have any idea what the outcome of the game would be going into it. And I, I don't think we have that. I, I think we're getting better at that, but I think there are some games that you know for a fact this team is going to just trounce this other team and there's nothing they can do. I think anything to make that better, anything to make more parity, bring teams closer together, um, 
playing wise, talent wise, level wise, I think is is good for the league as a whole. Now we as and I, I've said this over the years too, when you see players leaving teams and signing free agents and things like that, the sign of a healthy league. And then someone's like, well, I thought you said that. And I'm like, yeah, but it wasn't supposed to happen to us. <laughs> but, and, uh, and you played with a couple of those guys, you know, down in Florida. Of course. Yeah. I enjoyed it. Yeah. I mean, listen, like I said, I hope that people, there's going to be growing games. It's not going to be perfect. I hope people give it some time. And towards the end of the season, there's grumbling. Okay, so be it. But let's give it two, three months. Let's see how it plays out. Let's get people get accustomed to it. If it sucks, like I said, hand up. I'm, yeah. Okay, I'm wrong. But, like, let's give it a chance. Again, I know goalies are the most upset. And if I was a goalie, I would probably be upset too. But for everyone else, let's try to give it let's try to give it a real a real chance and like i said i think you're going to be very happy when you see some of those really good players are going to be outstanding to you you're gonna be like, wow i thought this guy was good now he's really good trust me i ain't gonna be one of them but <laughs> someone else is going to be and they're gonna show you how truly good they really are and you're gonna see it from like guys i named you know and I'm going to be excited to watch it when I'm not playing against them. When yeah. I am, I hope that it's not being done to me, you know? So that's really it. There's been a, there's been a couple of comments here. I, I, I haven't been ignoring you guys, but I just want to kind of let the conversation go here. Um, the uh, Jack said the counterattack is arguably one of the most exciting things in sports if run well. Um, these are all great points. I and mean, that was one of the things that Keith said is he said the counterattack with, especially with odd man rushes. Um, and I mean, you get the counterattack at a home, you know, home arena with an odd man rush and the crowd goes crazy because they know what's happening and they know what's about to happen. It's one of the more exciting things in indoor soccer and to create more of those, the better. I mean, we used to play against Kansas city and it was the possession game. We'd possess, we'd possess, we'd possess, we'd possess. We'd take a shot, it would miss, it would deflect just the wrong way. And it was a three on two the other way and they would always score. And and for Kansas City fans, that was the most exciting thing. For Wave fans, it was like, you know, the whole, remember the old uh, you know, agony of, uh, or the, what was it called? The agony of defeat and the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat thing on the, like the ABC Wide World of Sports commercials. Maybe too young for I'm not, I'm, I'm old. Sorry. Uh, but, uh, I remember watching those as kids and there was always the, you know, the thrill of victory was people cheering the agony defeat with some like downhill skier, like busting himself off a jump or whatever. And, uh, it was just you know, one of those things where it, it's, it, the, it, everyone, you know, the highs and lows of the game. And I think we need more of that. And I think, uh, I think there have been a lot of downtime in games and anything to kind of reduce that downtime, is better for the fans and better for the game as a whole. Yeah, I mean, listen, like a counterattack, like you said, is going to make it more exciting. Um, regardless, it, it, it will. And I, I think you're going to see them reverse, right? Let's say Judica goes down one way and I miss a back post tap in and it bounces off the boards and it goes the other way. Now Ian's going back the other way and now it's your chance to score. You know, I think it can get very very exciting. Will people say that that kind of ruins the purity of like, you know, patterns and movement and whatever else? Maybe, but I'm hoping with this rule, you'll get a mixture of both. I think the, the, what are they calling the tic tac toe goals? There's a much better yeah. chance of it. And, and we've seen that you, you mentioned San Diego. I mean, they were, they were one of the best at a long throw, three passes and a goal with the ball never touching the ground. For sure. Yep. You just I watch mean, that and you're, really like, and you're like, holy crap, what just happened? You know, you got to rewind it and take a look or, you know, they play the replay and you're just like, wow. Yeah. I mean, again, like you, you think about, you know, their team, they throw it long to Tavoy. He holds it. He lays it off to Nelson or Marcio who finds someone like Craig or, or you know, a Skoda and bang, it's an upper, upper 90 goal and everyone loves it. Right. Like, you know, like I said, on the flip side, I hated it because he's throwing a perfect ball at the boy who can't lose the ball, and it sucks playing against it. But, you know, we needed to do a better job of adapting to it. And 
credit to them because they figured out a great way to use it for you know the personnel that they had. And that's the thing you you were talking about that before and it, the the whole adapting thing. Um, and Ronald, I haven't been ignoring your comments. I have been reading them. Uh, he's saying you know he he dealt with the MPSL um, pass back rule, didn't like it. Uh, and then if you plan on dumping in the corners, you're going to need size to keep possession offensively. I mean, all these things are true. I think what's going to happen I more is anything. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I think this is going to breed less possession overall and more back and forth. And I think I think for the over for the players, you guys are going to hate all the running you're going to have to do. But that's why you get you know you work out and train and get in shape and everything. But I think for the fans, it's going to be one of the best things ever. You know, just back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Um, it you know, granted, one of the best games I saw, and I, I always bring this up, and Gio's not here tonight, but uh, I always bring this up: the the two to one Milwaukee over Baltimore win in the in the last game before the play before the championship three seasons ago was one of the most exciting games I've ever seen, and there were only three goals scored. But it's a different kind of excitement, and I think there's still a chance yeah. for that kind of excitement. But when when you know you have a game that's like fifteen to ten. I think that has a chance to be much more exciting too. Right. right. <laughs> Excuse me. Ooh. So I think uh, I think now is a good time to probably end this. We don't have Matt anymore, and it's, you know, after eleven year time out there. Yep. But you know, really appreciate you uh, joining for us tonight. Uh, I know we've been trying to get a hold of you, you know, or not getting a hold of you, but getting you on the show for a while, and I just schedule. I'm gonna sneeze again. Hang on. I'm out here quick. Okay, sorry about that. Um, but yeah, no, I appreciate uh, you coming on. Um, let's see what uh, maybe we'll talk halfway through the season. See what how things are going. We'll do a touch base then. Yeah, um, yeah. Like I said, the only thing I, I would just leave everyone off is I'm not for against whatever else. I think it's going to hopefully do good things for the league. And we should all just try and stick by it and promote it. Um, and then, you know, towards the end, if it's awful, we can all turn <laughs> negative against it. But for now, let's all kind of like stick together. I see everyone's point of views. I'm not on one side or the other. I'm just trying to embrace the value and positivity you can have for the league. And hopefully it does. Sounds good. All right. Have a good night. All right. See you, everybody. Well, appreciate it.